there has been research, modern double-blind research that's been done since 1949, an enormous amount of research that's been done in the last 10 and 15 years, and you have too many uh, professional organizations that uh, have stuck their head in the sand. On the other hand, even in the face of an enormous amount of pressure, you've had organizations like the American Nurses Association, the American Public Health Association, and most recently the American College of Physicians, which has 124,000 members, not only saying that they support the medical use of marijuana, but that it should be rescheduled so it should be used. Briefly in regards to my background, I, I must say that I'm a, probably a slower learner than Frank. It took me about 20 years from the first time somebody talked to me about medical cannabis and actually the first time that I looked it up in the 1927 edition of Remington's textbook pharmacy to really appreciate that cannabis was medicine. Now that may be because the first person that told me about cannabis as medicine was my father and one always wants to disagree with their father when you're a young man. My father was a pharmacist starting in 1928. His, one of his assignments in pharmacy school was to make tincture of cannabis. And he said, you know, we had to be very careful because the alcohol was illegal. <laughs> now, one of the things that doctors uh, like Frank and, uh, and I do is we make sure that the people that we're making recommendations to are sick. Not because we don't believe that it helps people who aren't uh, seriously ill or deathly ill, but because we know the Medical Board of California are, in my opinion, incompetent. And I say that as somebody who has 14 years experience doing quality assurance work and who was asked to apply for the position of Medical Director of the National Committee on Quality Assurance, the most prestigious quality assurance organization in the country. The California Medical Board does not know what they're doing. Anyway, two thing, quick things I wanted to end with. One is, I've had a number of patients in the last month that have come in and said, Dr. Bierman, you changed my life. And it's embarrassing because all that I've done, all that Frank Lucido has done, all that Greg Carter has done, all that Sue Neal has done, has been doctors. We do a history, we do a physical, we listen to the person, we listen to them saying, this stuff has made my life different, and we have recommended it, and we have made them legal. We have made it able for them to obtain medicine. This should not be an exceptional act. This should not be an act of courage and bravery. It is, but it shouldn't be. And all that doctors who wonder about this need to do is to see patients and practice medicine. Uh, I've got about 35 hours worth of material, but something tells me I should stop right now and turn it over to questions. I, I'm sure that there's many of us who'd love to uh, hear more, but more than anything else today for this panel, if you're just wandering in, these are uh, medical marijuana doctors. They want to be able to answer your questions about medical cannabis. If you're currently using it and it's not working for you or it is working for you, if you know someone who can benefit, we're going to be taking some questions right now. And uh, as you can see, we've got uh, researchers, physicians, and, and a cannabinologist, which just 10 years ago, they would have just called him a pothead. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're incredibly fortunate to see that. And so let's see some hands go up and see who, can, uh, who has any questions for our panel. I'd like to ask Dr. Behrman and Dr. Lucido, what proportion of your practice is devoted to cannabis medicine? Uh, my, my, mine is about 50-50. I've been doing general family practice since 79, and it was probably about a third cannabis, uh, two-thirds uh, two primary care, until about three months ago when we completely uh, went off all insurances because we were losing money on the, this weird thing of the insurance business industry. So uh, that's about 50-50. Uh, my practice uh, was uh, set up uh, as a result of uh, doing expert witness work uh, and uh, uh, covering a practice down in L.A. for a while. And I don't do any advertising. I mean, if you find my name on somebody's website saying Dr. Bierman recommends cannabis, it's an unauthorized use of my name. People know that I uh, understand
understand that cannabis is valuable. And most of the patients that I see are looking for a competent physician with a good reputation to make recommendations. Now, I used to do uh, general medicine. I've done a lot of different things. Uh, I've done administrative medicine and public health. Uh, so I will, uh, in some instances, uh, take care of uh, uh, other uh, conditions that don't require cannabis. Uh, I certainly will write prescriptions not only uh, for uh, Marinol but also for uh, other medications. Uh, but I try to refer people back to their primary care physician. So the vast majority of my practice uh, deals with uh, rather ill people who uh, get benefit from medical cannabis. Yeah. It's quite something because I think the federal government would make it uh, try and demonize some of the doctors who are working with patients on this by saying that the patients just seek you out because you'll recommend cannabis. And overwhelmingly, people who want cannabis can get access to it. Patients seek out these doctors because they know and are familiar. They're willing to study the available research around the medical uses of cannabis. And so I think that's fantastic. Can, can that's I say one other thing in, in regards to that question is at least 70 healthcare professionals in the Santa Barbara area have referred one or more patients to me. And what I want to put myself out of business. I mean, the, the, the problem is in California is that the Medical Board of California has scared the hell out of doctors. And this precedes medical marijuana. They have a reputation for acting in an arbitrary, capricious, and confrontive fashion. And they've been on a witch hunt in regards to medical marijuana. As a matter of fact, I sued the Medical Board of California. I got an amicus brief supporting my position from the California Medical Association to protect patient privacy. And now my, my attorney and I are suing them, and I say my attorney and I because he's doing this on contingency. Uh, we're suing the medical board to get the money it cost to sue them in the first place because what they tried to do was illegal, and in, they are infringing on doctors' civil rights. If they stop doing that, what you will see is many, many more doctors making these recommendations. These 70 physicians will stop referring them to me and they'll open their mouths and say, yeah, I think it is good for you. You know, even the referrals are a nice sign of progress. They used to be that doctors should just say no and I don't want to hear any more about it. At least they're willing to give a name out of someone with some experience. Oh, hi. And we all know cigarettes cause cancer. Does marijuana cause cancer? If not, why not? Great yeah, Dr. Donald Tashkin is a pulmonologist at UCLA, and he spoke at the last Patients Out of Time conference in the Silomar, and uh, he recrunched his numbers. He's the one that the drug war people were saying, see, his studies say it could cause cancer. What he actually said was the, the, the lung biopsies of ca uh, pot smokers and tobacco smokers, heavy, heavy of each, showed some what he considered precancerous changes. So he wasn't sure. He recrunched his numbers, added more people to studies, and came to the adamant conclusion the pot smokers had no more cancer than the non-smokers whereas the cigarette smokers had actually more cancer obviously and Donald, uh, Donald Abrams had gotten to introduce him and was the only one that could ask a question he said looks to me from the numbers the pot smokers had less cancer and he said well it's not statistically significant so it's basically a tie pot smokers and non-smokers had an equal number of cancers there can be some in each but it's like not to do with tobacco it's tobacco is clearly a cancer causer whether it's the smoke, whether it's the additives, we don't know. The, uh, the uh, write-up to that study, the final write-up, he's actually had to posit the fact that ca cannabis and cannabinoids might be having a protective effect on people because the cannabis smoking group wasn't developing it as, as, uh, as readily as the non-smoking group, and, uh, which is quite something. And of course, that's in smoking. Uh, maybe one of you guys can answer the question in non-smoke materials, too. Well, wait a minute. Oh, before, oh, before we get off of, of, of this, uh, we're not just talking about uh, lung cancer. There was recently a study that came out from the University of Wisconsin, which is where I did my undergraduate work, showing that cancer was useful in, in decreasing the incidence of colorectal cancer. There's at least eight studies that demonstrate that, that cannabis decreases the incidence of various kinds of, uh, uh, of cancer and that it is useful in retarding uh, the advance of gliomas which means that hemp fest should be being celebrated by Senator Kennedy by him smoking on a doobie uh, or having some edibles because that will be treating his glioma and I recommend it for Senator Kennedy. <laughs>